The themes of light and darkness have been used since the dawn of human thought to illustrate the depths of our shared experience. We say of someone in the performance industry with the urge to be known that they long for the spotlight, or we will describe our best ideas as those with which the light bulb has come on for us. So it should be as no surprise that light and darkness play vital roles in the language of faith as well, such as in the Hank Williams song, I Saw the Light. Light and darkness play major roles in our text for today as well, in John chapter three. John chapter three contains probably the most well-known verse in all of the Bible, verse 16. And most of us have probably memorized it somewhat like this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So let's shine a spotlight on that verse and on the ones around it to see a little bit more about why it is so powerful and how it really could change your life. John 3.16 comes in the middle of an encounter Jesus has with a man named Nicodemus. Jesus has just recently turned water into wine, overturned the tables in the temple, and now he's done a few other miracles. So Nicodemus says to Jesus, we know that you are from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs that you are doing if God were not with them. John, our writer of this encounter, also goes to great lengths here to point out to us that Nicodemus has come to Jesus at night. He is quite literally standing in the shadows. This becomes very important for this chapter because Jesus will use the setting of being in the darkness to set up what he is going to teach here. The detail of Nicodemus being in the shadows emphasizes the drama of light and darkness. As I mentioned earlier, light plays a major role in understanding the words and claims of scripture. It is also referenced in Matthew chapter five, where Jesus says that those who follow him are the light of the world. Now this can be confusing, I know, because Jesus will go on to say later on in John chapter eight, that he is the light of the world and whoever follows him would not walk in darkness. Jesus saying in Matthew five that we are the light of the world does not mean that we are like him in essence. If I were to show you a lit candle and ask you what it is, you'd say a candle or a light, but it's really two things. It's the light itself and the thing that holds the light. Another way to think of it would be like the moon, which does not produce any light of its own, but which comes out of the darkness of space or the shadow of the earth in order to reflect the light of the sun. Jesus' followers are the light of the world in the sense that they are the containers that hold the light, the light being Jesus himself. So a few years ago, I was blessed with the opportunity to go to Israel and stand in the vicinity of where Jesus gave that talk about his followers being the light of the world. It was along the coast on the Sea of Galilee, and it's recorded in Matthew chapters five through seven, known as the Sermon on the Mount. The landscape of the Sea of Galilee is honestly not much different than the Tennessee Valley. There are rolling hills and mountains everywhere, and you can see clear across the body of water just as you could at Lake Gunnersville or the Tennessee River. The Sea of Galilee has also the distinction of being the lowest body of fresh water on the planet. This is due to the topography. It is almost completely surrounded by mountain ranges, like a crater would be. Once I realized this, it illuminated my understanding of what Jesus was saying in Matthew chapter five. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. When Jesus said these words, they had added meaning because the listeners were surrounded completely by hills. There isn't much in those hills that could have been hidden. Thy strength indeed is small 
Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thy love in all. Cause Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Welcome to Lincoln Village. Here on the north side of downtown sits one of our mission partners in Huntsville. If you've lived in the city even for a short time, you've heard of Lincoln Community, once one of the historic mills around Huntsville. Over the last 18 years, God has been faithful in bringing the body of Christ together to help Lincoln Village ministry restore and redeem this area of Huntsville. The mission of Lincoln Village Ministry is to share in the transforming power of the gospel of Christ. They holistically served under-resourced students and families by providing educational opportunities, safe and affordable housing, and support in every aspect of life. In 2002, Mark Starnes walked these streets of Lincoln Village. Just a few steps separated some of the wealthiest homes in Huntsville from these, those who were left behind and forgotten. Mark tells the story of walking into a home of a little girl and her mom, a home that had dirt floors, no electricity and no running water. And he knew with stepping into this house, he was stepping into a new calling in his life and thus began Lincoln Village Ministry. With support for students all the way from preschool to high school, children grow in a healthy environment. This private Christian school is centrally located right in the middle of Lincoln campus right here at Lincoln Academy. It's a safe and affordable childcare is provided as well, along with after school and summer programs. The Lincoln Academy experience is more than just an education though. It's where these children are nurtured, they're encouraged, and they're valued for who they are in Christ. 
Along with the academy, these two neighborhoods have been restored through their acquisition and renovation of homes to provide safe and affordable housing. And this is where FBC, our church, has made the biggest difference. The village, as they call it, houses nearly 100 residents in fully renovated homes. Residents are equipped with resources, community events, support staff, a missional family, match saving plans, and a sustainable way of life. If anyone asks me, what's the best model of sustainable mission work in Huntsville, I point them right here to Lincoln Village. I'm here with Mike Kirk. Uh, Mike, would you tell us a little bit more about Lincoln and how FBC got involved here? Okay, uh, about 18 years ago, one of our First Baptist members, Gordon Perry, heard that a couple of houses in the Lincoln Mill area were being renovated and that volunteers were needed. Um, he and a few of the guys in the church came over to work on a Thursday. And as the story goes, at the end of the day, they looked around and decided there was still work to be done. So they decided to come back the following Thursday, and we've had a group of guys coming back every Thursday since. For 20 years now. For almost 20 years. So what's some of the work that FBC members do here, and, and can you tell us a little bit more about that? Okay, um, our primary area is in the area of renovation of the houses, construction, and we do everything from framing, demolition, all the way up through hanging blinds and caulking and putting in faucets and those kind of things. So it's a wide range of skill levels, um, and it's just a lot of fun to, to be together and to, to help others. So when Lincoln acquires one of these homes, you're gonna take it down to the studs and you're gonna fully renovate it from there. That's, that's correct. Most, most of the houses are, the outside looks about the same as far as the shape. Uh, the inside we, is removed and a brand new house is built on the inside. So if I'm one of these individuals watching today and I wanna get involved, Maybe I'm really good with a hammer and maybe I've never touched a hammer before. How can I get involved? Uh, I would suggest checking out the, the Lincoln uh, website, Lincoln Ministries website, uh, to see the number of ways you can plug in with Lincoln. If you're interested, particularly in construction, uh, you can contact the church and we'll get you involved. That's great. Well, thanks Mike and, and thank you to all the guys and, and gals and kids that have helped here at Lincoln Village. Thank you. And now a reading from the Word of God, John 3, 16 through 21. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done, they have done in the sight of God. So I talked about the light of the world in Matthew chapter five, but what about John three? In today's passage, Nicodemus has come to Jesus and John makes it clear to us that he has come in the darkness. John also goes to lengths to make sure that we know that Nicodemus is a Pharisee. Pharisee comes from the Hebrew and Aramaic word perushi, and it means separated one. One of the things at least a fringe of them believed, if not all of them, was that if they could lead Israel in living a certain kind of way or achieving a certain kind of purity, then that would usher in the age of the promised Messiah. This led to them being extreme rule followers for their day, the highest moral examples around. A Pharisee would have told you, this rule follow, this way of life is the path to life. A Pharisee would have said, I saw the light 
and told you that their way of interpreting faith in God was the way, which again is why it is powerful that John points out to us that Nicodemus is standing in the dark. Jesus tells him, I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven. He says this speaking of himself. So what could Jesus possibly be meaning here? There are two things. I had some free time when I was at the Sea of Galilee. So I walked out there one night alone in the darkness. The shoreline is remarkably undeveloped to this day. Probably not much different than it was in the days of Jesus. In this place where Jesus said, you are the light of the world, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. You wouldn't have missed a light parked somewhere in those hills. It would have resembled the view that we have now, where over my shoulder, you can see the lights of downtown Huntsville. Here's the thing about lights in the darkness. They indicate that there is life there. Sometimes we will see in the movies where someone is alone and on the run, and in spite of being cold or hungry, they will never light a fire because the second that they do, they give away their, lo their location. Light in the darkness indicates that there is life there. To this day, on the Sea of Galilee, there is only one city along the coastline. It is the city of Tiberias. And it was around in the time of Jesus. When Jesus stood on the shore of the Sea of Galilee and said a city on a hill could not be hidden, he was talking about the city of Tiberias in plain sight. My tour guide in Israel said that Tiberias now is sort of a sleepy community with not much going on. But in Jesus's day, it was strictly a non-Jewish city, in some sense a military base or economic base for the Roman citizens in the area. My guide said that this led to Tiberias, at least being seen by the Jews as the Las Vegas of its region. So imagine yourself at night on the Sea of Galilee. You've heard Jesus say that a city on a hill cannot be hidden. You see the lights of Tiberias and you know that that means there are signs of life there. You hear the revelry of all that happens just as we hear the signs of life around us as I speak. A Roman or a non-Jew would have looked at Tiberias and said, I've saw the light. This is the way to life. And a Pharisee would have looked at his way of life and said, I saw the light. This is the way to life. Jesus tells us they were both wrong. And this is the first thing that he wants Nicodemus to grasp. By calling his followers the light of the world and contrasting them with the literal city on a hill that they could all see right behind them. He's telling them that Tiberius isn't the way to life. He is, and he does this in two sentences. And they don't need more than that to get the idea. But he spends a whole lot more time in his ministry talking about the Pharisee way of doing things. And again, reiterating to the people that he is the path to life, not what the Pharisees do. Do you think the Pharisees were ever like, why don't you talk more about the people over in Tiberias? They are worse sinners than we are. But unlike the Romans in Tiberias, the Pharisees used the language of the faith. There was more to unpack there. Represented by Nicodemus lurking in the shadows, they were almost to the light, but they had to be convinced that they weren't actually there. Almost married is still not married. Almost graduated is still not graduated. And being in the dark is still being in the dark, no matter if it's the middle of the, of the night or just before the sunrise. That is the first thing that Jesus is making clear to Nicodemus here. Nicodemus already knew that the way to life was not to live as those in Tiberias did. But at that moment, Jesus was talking directly to a Pharisee and wanted Nicodemus to know that the way to life wasn't to live as the Pharisees live either. So that's the first thing. What's the second thing? I mentioned earlier that humanity has used the themes of light and dark to illustrate our reality. 
400 years before the time of Jesus, Plato told the allegory of the cave, where men are chained to a wall of a cave and facing in the direction of a blank wall in front of them. The only thing they can see are shadows on the wall in front of them that are cast by objects passing in front of a fire that is behind them. When someone who has been outside of the cave in the light comes in to tell them of the outside world, only then can they begin to understand that there might be more than what they know. The discussion that Jesus has with Nicodemus in John chapter 3 verses 16 through 21 is philosophical in nature, with Jesus playing off of the fact that Nicodemus is literally standing in the dark. And it resembles this allegory of the cave. In the way that Jesus tells it, he is the one who has lived outside of the cave and has now come to save the world by telling others about the light. When Jesus says that no one has gone into heaven except the one who has come from heaven, he is telling Nicodemus that Nicodemus and the Pharisees are in the cave and have not fully seen the light. Jesus also points out that he comes to save. He doesn't come to condemn those in the darkness. Being in the dark of the cave is already condemnation enough. This is the second thing that Jesus wants Nicodemus to grasp. He has come to tell them the truth, that there is light and it is he. There is life and he is the one that offers it. There is a better way to live and it is through him. This message is for the irreligious people of Tiberias, yes, but it is also for the religious people like Nicodemus, like the Pharisees, and like some of us. In what ways could it be possible that you and I are like Nicodemus, where we are so close to the, to the light that we think we are in the light, but we are really still in the shadows? This phenomenon is nothing new. In Jesus' day, it was the Pharisees who said that to be true followers of God, you had to do it in their particular way. In Paul's day, it was the Judaizers who said you couldn't be a Christian if you weren't circumcised and obeyed the Jewish ritual customs. In John's day, it was the Greek Gnostics who said that to be true Christians, you had to attain a certain level of knowledge. In our day, what do you think are some ways that you and I say or do things like this? True followers do it this way. You can't be a Christian and do it that way. All real Christians know this and do that. The gospel comes with some hard lines drawn in the sand, no doubt. It has some very clear distinctions, but there are some things that are not so clear. Things that we tend to make into hard lines as well ourselves. Things that a first century believer would see and scratch their heads about. The prophet Isaiah wrote, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Almost married is still not married. Almost graduated is still not graduated. Almost Christianity is not Christianity and sounds like Christianity is not Christianity. There was a time when Pharisees, Judaizers, and Greek Gnostics perverted the good news by attaching bad or unnecessary requirements to it. But as we read on in scripture, we see the Pharisee Nicodemus advocating for Jesus in John chapter seven and attending to Jesus at his burial in John 19 that all but cements his status as a follower. We see circumcised Jews like Paul and Timothy celebrating the gospel and fiercely advocating that acceptance of the gospel does not also mean the acceptance of unnecessary cultural beliefs. And we see Greek philosophers like those in Acts 17 compelled by the light of the truth of scripture to become believers and aid in the spreading of that light. That's the beauty of this faith of ours. Jesus's table is long and it will include politicians and philosophers of every pers persuasion, Pharisees and prostitutes, tradesmen and tax collectors, capitalists and communists. And the Bible will go on to tell us 
people of every nation, every tribe, and every tongue. I can't quite wrap my brain around how that works, but the Bible leaves us with no other conclusion to draw. And if you can't accept that, if you can't sit across the table from someone like that, the Lord's table, and if that doesn't sound like heaven to you, whether you are on the right or the left of the divide that we see in our country, whether you are in the city of Tiberias or in the sandals of Nicodemus, well, then you might need to be the one to repent, to ask for a new birth and to step into the light. But the good news is, Jesus doesn't come to condemn you. He comes to call you into that way of life and into the actual, real, true, and beautiful light. So come, step into that light and see for yourself. Thank you for being with us this morning. I'm Charlie, the Minister of Contemporary Worship. And I'm Sam, the ministry resident for young adults. And we're so glad that you joined us for TV Church this morning. Now, if you've been touched by our time together or the message that you heard today, we really hope that you'll tell a friend and invite them to check it out too. We like to say that FBC is a church at the heart of the city, but with a heart for our region. And we really want to provide the Tennessee Valley with the message of Jesus. We'd love to connect with you and help you engage further with the ministries here at First Baptist. You can text us at the number below here on the screen. And we'd love to pray for you this week and let you know more about the ministries and opportunities we have here for you. How much we connect with you is entirely up to you. We won't take advantage of any information you decide to share with us. Join me as we close in prayer. Father God, we are so thankful for your goodness. We are thankful for your wisdom and your knowledge that you will instill in us in these coming days and these trials. We're thankful for the ability to connect and to fellowship with one another, no matter how that looks, whether that's between a screen or in the same room with masks on. We thank you for that opportunity. We ask that you continue to guide us and continue to bless us in these hard days. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Now, we've begun a journey together from the day when Jesus invited the first people to follow him to the day when Jesus walked out of the tomb. This journey will eventually take us to Easter, and we hope that you'll stick around and join this journey with us.